Glad you guys are here this evening, uh, Lesson 24, through our series in the book of Proverbs. Uh, this evening, I've titled the, the lesson, Life and Death. As you'll see, when we study the book of Proverbs, a lot of the th things that Solomon uh, tells us to do and uh, admonishes us to do are because they will bring life, and if we don't do those things, then we will end up in death. Uh, life is mentioned 38 times in the book of Proverbs, and death is mentioned 18 times. Now, the Bible speaks of death as a physical death and spiritual death, and the Bible also speaks of life as spiritual life and physical life. Uh, context will tell you uh, what is the meaning. But when, uh, for example, when Adam and Eve told they would die, uh, did they die when they ate the fruit? No, they did not die then and there. They eventually ended up dying physically, but that day, that fateful day, they died spiritually. When God gave Israel the law, he says, I set before you life and death. Let me read to you a few verses from the book of Deuteronomy, and you'll see the, that the law itself, if obeyed, would provide life. If disobeyed, would result in death. Uh, where do I get this from? Uh, the law itself. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 10 says, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments, and the statutes which are written in this book of the law. And if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Do you see that? With all thine heart and with all thy soul. For this command which, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee. Neither is it far off. God is telling the children of Israel, the law is, you know it now, because I gave it to you. And God continues on and says, the law is not in heaven. That thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. God is telling the Israelites, I have now revealed to you the things which I require of you. And then he says in 13, Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. And this is the key verse. See, I have set before thee this day. That's right. Life and good, and death and evil. The choice was theirs. Would they choose life or would they choose death? Now, I've got to keep in mind that obedience to the law required a uh, right heart. Remember, it, as God is telling them to obey the law, He also told them to turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thine soul. Uh, you can obey the law, but if your heart is not in it, God is not going to uh, take kindly to your obedience. Uh, obedience, according to the law, resulted in life, and disobedience resulted in death. The righteous man seeks life, and the wicked seeks death. We see that throughout the book of Proverbs. The wise man seeks life, but the fool seeks death. Have you heard of the phrase self-destructive behavior? Uh, some people are prone to that. This is when you do something that causes negative consequences in your life. Some people just can't help themselves. They just can't. I don't know what it is. It's a, a, you can't call it a short circuit in the brain. I would probably call, call it a short circuit in the heart. There's something wrong with a person's heart when he continuously does things that are self-destructive. And with this uh, brief introduction, let us go into the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're going to look at verse 8, uh, chapter 14, verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Fools make a mock at sin. I love that verse. But among the righteous there is favor. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown. But the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth, and the end of that mirth, the mirth here is referring to the laughter, is heaviness. The backslider in heart. You notice that? The backslider in heart. Uh, shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. So we begin with verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of the fools is deceit. Uh, we have repeatedly dealt with uh, the prudent. Uh, to be prudent is to act with, uh, uh, with uh, thought of, of, with in mind. When you're prudent, you basically think before you act. You understand that your actions have consequences. Sometimes my kids run into things, they step on things, they trip over things, and I ask them, did you not see it? Uh, they weren't being prudent. Uh, prudent is someone who walks circumspectly. Uh, to walk circumspectly is to be careful to consider uh, 
the, the, <clears throat> the circumstances before you act uh, and you consider your actions. Uh, sometimes people just act. We have uh, uh, the children and we say to them sometimes, well, why do you just react? Think before you act. And many of us are that way. Or we are programmed to react rather than to think. But I guess that's what maturity uh, comes from. Uh, eventually you'll get old enough that you won't be able to react. So you'll have no choice but to think before you act. Because you can't react. You can't move fast enough. I tell my children walking, and as a joke, walking is becoming a, uh, a physical chore as you get older. A dangerous activity, correct. Walking <laughs> is becoming a dangerous activity the older you get. Uh, so, and then you forget what you've said before, so you have to be reminded by your children. But a prudent person is devoted to understanding his ways. You always self-examine yourself. The Bible, one of the principles of spiritual maturity is self-examination. You bring yourself before God every day, and you have, uh, see, I'm going to read it from the Bible. Uh, David says better than I can say it. In Psalms 139, verse 24, he says, And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way everlasting. Uh, search my heart of God, right? And see if there be any wicked way in me. I have uh, duplicated the verse over here, because I probably missed one. But the, uh, on the contrary, the foolish man is always deceiving himself. Plato said, the worst, the worst of all deceptions, the self-deception. Have you wondered why the world is the way it's in right now? That's because these people are self-deceived. They are always lying to themselves. They have convinced themselves that their way is right. And that's the danger even among Christians. You convince yourself that your way is right. You cannot always lie to yourself. It will lead you down the wrong road. Mm -hmm. um, I've often asked myself, and, and it's troubling, what causes self-deception? I see the world around me and I see all these people are so deceived. Why is it that some believe lies about themselves and about the world? Why is it that? Uh, I, I've never, I know the answer. You know, the sad thing is, I ask myself the question, but I know the answer. And it's sad that the answer is very simple. And, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, self-deception always applies to those who are overly confident. And self-deception also, unfortunately, applies to those who are self-deprecating. Do you find yourself being self-deprecating? Some of us are prone to that. So self-deprecating is when you uh, belittle yourself. You always tell yourself, I'm not good enough. Uh, I am uh, worthless. I am uh, dumb. Well, you may be dumb, but, uh, <laughs> but you got to be careful, right? Um, when I was young, I had an issue with... Uh, Again, don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way with me saying it, because I hope it come, doesn't come out the wrong way. I had an issue with people that had a low level of comprehension. I couldn't understand why that was. Uh, but then one day I was riding a city bus back in Montreal. We would ride a city bus to go back and home from school, and, and to go from home to school, and from school to home. And uh, I, I used to dream, daydream a lot as a child. So I would walk in the city bus, and one time I looked inside the window, and I saw a bunch of guys picking up garbage and throwing it in the back of the garbage can. I must have been, what, seven years old, eight years old, and I was thinking these things at that age. And I said to myself, there has to be garbage men in this world, because who else would pick up the trash? Now, I, I hope it's not coming out wrong, but uh, not everybody's going to be a rocket scientist. It's just a fact of life. Sure. I hope it's not coming out wrong. But I, just the things that go into the mind of a child sometimes. Uh, I, was, I must have been a weird kid, right? Some people are laughing. Uh, but that's okay. you got to laugh at yourself. Uh, Self-deception. And this is the answer. You ready for this? It's very simple. The answer is simple. Self-deception occurs uh, when you believe anything about yourself or about the world that's not from the Bible. That's where it comes from. Uh, mm -hmm. And that includes what you believe about yourself. Uh, I, I used to be, you know, uh, hard preaching. We talk about hard preaching. People say, oh, I love hard preaching. Hard preaching is good, but it has to be biblical preaching. Right. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I've always been uncomfortable is those preachers that deride the saints. They berate the bride of Christ, and they tell you you're oh, good for nothing. They call you a sinner. Well, I was a sinner. I'm no longer a sinner because I got saved. Uh, the reason why I got saved is because I was a sinner. 
They call you animated dirtball. They call you all these names. No, I am not these things now. I'm a child of the king. I'm a son of God. I am a king. I am a priest. Why don't they preach about these things, uh, the things that we are in Christ? It doesn't mean I'm perfect. But, I, but according to the Bible, I'm not worthless. Christ thought so much of me that he shed his blood for me. He bought me with a precious price. Do you know the price of Christ, what it cost Christ to ransom me from, from the devil? It was his life. It was his life. So when you have that mindset, you are precious. You are so precious that God's thought so much of you that he decided to come in the flesh. And he decided to die for you and for me. Now that's the kind of preaching that's biblical. Not like you're an animated dirt ball. Where are you going to find that in the Bible that you're an animated? Now there is nothing good in the flesh. But inside me and you, there's a precious treasure. And that treasure is the living God. Now, if I refuse to obey God, I am worthy of reproof and rebuke. I am worthy of correction. And I should accept correction. All of us should accept correction. Uh, no one is above correction. If I do something wrong, I need to be told. If you do something wrong, you need to be told. If you can't be told when you're doing something wrong, then, then you have pride in your heart. It all boils down to that. Are you humble enough to take correction? What does the Bible say? Iron sharpeneth iron just like a brother sharpeneth a brother. I think I mixed that up a little bit. But the Bible tells us in the next verse that fools mock at sin. But among the righteous there is favor. A fools laugh at sins. They joke about their sin. They, 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 I remember when I was in high school, the kids, when they would do something wrong and they got away with it, they would laugh about it and talk about it. And that was that's wrong. And the lost people give... Uh, their sin, pet names, we'll get into those pet names in a little bit. Charles Spurgeon said, do not give fair names to foul sins. Call them what you will, or they will smell no sweeter. He had a way with words. Uh, today in our society, adulterers and fornicators are called consenting adults. Perversion is called an alternative lifestyle. Lust is called love. Insider trading is called stock tips. Have you ever wondered why Congress is exempt from insider trading? Don't you wish that someone would come to you and say, hey, invest in the stock and you'll retire in five years or ten years? <clears throat> That's how these people uh, go in into political office poor and they come out multimillionaires. They couldn't make that amount of money from the salary. They're getting uh, insider information. Pride is called self-esteem. Gluttony is called having a, a healthy appetite. Oh, I have a healthy appetite. No, you're a glutton. Uh, Hot-tempered. I am hot-tempered. And what do we say? Well, I've got Irish blood in me. No, you just can't control your anger, your temper. That's right. A scorner is called opinionated. There was a comedian one time and he says, you know, uh, I am mad. And sometimes I don't even know why. That's because my mother was Italian and my father was Irish. He just started cracking up when he said that. He gets mad and he doesn't even know why. And he blames it on his genetics. That was funny though. I laughed. And on and on we can go. The Bible says the favor comes to the righteous. Wisdom tells us in Proverbs 3, 4, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Who will find this kind of favor? It is those who pursue and seek after wisdom. I tell my children, I tell them, pray for wisdom. Uh, especially one of my particular boys, I said, uh, have you, Are you praying for wisdom? Do you know that God, if you naturally don't have wisdom, we don't all have the same amount of wisdom. Have you know, met some people that are not book smart, but they're street smart? Mm -hmm. They have a lot of common sense. Yeah. Uh, you're born that way sometimes. Sometimes life, life lessons give you, give you all, that, all, those, all that common sense. But the Bible says if you don't have any wisdom, guess what you can do? You can, ask for, you can ask God. You know what God says? He will give it to you liberally. So we go on to the, uh, to the next verse. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. Uh, if you've lived long enough, you'll have to admit that life is bittersweet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It gives you uh, sweet things and it also gives you bitter things. And you know what happens sometimes? Uh, those bitter things stay with you for a long time. Yeah. They cause deep wounds and scars in your heart. And uh, the pain sometimes, only you know the pain of the bitter things that life has brought you. Uh, and, and it is a fact, and I'm going to read this, it is difficult for someone else to know the pain and the bitterness of your heart. 
Only you know it. Uh, but you know who else, who else knows it? God does. God does. Uh, Deep-seated pain in your heart is crushing to your bones, and it gnaws inside your soul. Uh, J. Vernon McGee said, Every heart has some secret joy or sorrow that no one can share. How true that is. Spurgeon said, We may not judge our brethren as though we understood them, and were competent to give a verdict upon them. Do not sit down like Job's friends and condemn the innocent. Many times you'll see some people who are drug addicts, who are alcoholics, and we condemn those people. But do you know the life stories of that person? Do you know what that person been through to get to that point where all he can do is drink away his sorrows or, get, or be high so he, for, he can forget the pain that was inflicted upon him when he was a child or a young person? We don't know that. I'm not condemning, or I'm not condoning alcohol abuse and drug abuse. But when you see these people, you have to have compassion for them and pray for them that perhaps God may deliver them. Uh, we all live life as individuals, even married couples. Yes, you're married, but you know that you still live your life as an individual? Okay. No two men see life the same, nor have the same life experiences. Only your own heart knows the bitterness, its own bitterness. And like I said, the only other person that knows it is God. And that's why Christ came. In Luke 4.18, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. In the, the Isaiah 53, we are told by his stripes we are healed. And the charismatics take that verse and they, they, they misquote it. But you know what Christ heals? He heals our broken hearts. Um, often, sometimes you'll find some people that are close to you and you can share your deepest pains and aches. But you know what happens when, when you do those things and you share those things with those people and they end up betraying you? It causes more pain and more sorrow. Isn't that the way life is? In Proverbs 18, 24, uh, the Bible says, A man hath friend, a man that hath friends must show, must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Uh, oftentimes you'll find friends that you can relate to better than you can your own siblings. That's a fact. That's a fact. Uh, a Spurgeon here, and regarding this verse, he listed uh, several joys that are personal nature. And I want to share you the list that he, he came up with. Uh, he says, these, these joys are personal in nature, and they cannot be shared with a stranger. He said, there's the joy of sin forgiven. What a joy that is to know that your sins are forgiven. Uh, there's joy of sin being conquered. There's joy of restored relationship with God. There's joy of accepted service. There's a joy in, when it comes to answered prayer. There's a joy when you recognize and realize that you are useful to God. Uh, the joy of peace in time of trouble. And the highest of all joys, he says, is the joy of communion with God. There is no greater joy than having a close walk with God. Isn't that, isn't that true? Isn't that true? Now, verse 11. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Now, this verse is pretty self-explanatory. When I came across this verse, you know what I thought of? The, the story of the man who built his house upon the sand and the man who's built his house upon a rock. Matthew 7, 24, the Bible says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, sounds like he's reading from the book of Proverbs, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the beat, and, uh, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built the house upon the sand. What, what two men... What words does Christ use to describe these two men? Wise and, wise and foolish. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like the book of Proverbs. The wise man and the foolish man. Let's go on to uh, verse number 12. We're going to spend a bit of time on this verse because this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible and a verse that we all should memorize. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof, what? Are the ways of death. Very important verse. Uh, this verse applies to every denomination. Every You've heard the expression, every ism and schism? Uh, because they all teach that their way is the right way. We had a question from someone who was watching the, uh, the uh, Revelations lesson. And they, they asked us a question regarding the Quran. And they, they asked and they said, well, the, the Muslims claim that the Quran was given to them by God. 
but I, then I answered back, and I still haven't heard a, uh, a um, back from my answer. And I said, well, anyone that teaches that Christ is not God in the flesh is cannot be of God. And that's how you test the religion. Now, the first thing is, is, uh, is Christ God in the flesh? Do you believe that Christ is God in the flesh, that he's the Son of God? And if that religion or whatever ism and schism that is, if they don't believe that, then it cannot be of God. It cannot be of God. Now then right away you may ask, well, uh, how about the Catholics? Well, they believe that Christ is God in the flesh. Yes, i got to give them credit for that. Uh, but the second test is, uh, how do you get to heaven? You have to give them the Acts 4.12 test. Neither is there salvation in the other, for there is none other name, which is Jesus Christ, under heaven, given among, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Do they believe that? Do they believe the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ? The first test is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. The second test is, is he the only way to heaven? And John reminds us in John 4.1, that's how we are to, to test the spirits. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And then he says in verse uh, 3 of the same chapter, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. What is basically John saying? If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God who came in human form, then you're not of God. That's how you test the spirits. And then the second test, as we said, uh, is salvation, is it through Christ or through anything else? Uh, and you know what it is? If they don't believe these things, if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, He is the only way to heaven, that their end, the Bible says, is death and destruction. In Matthew 7, 13, Jesus says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And you know what the saddest part of the whole verse is? And he says, And many there be which go in their act. This is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Because it tells me that most of humanity is going to end up in hell. And what it does to me, it makes my salvation even more precious. I remind my children and I say, uh, you're going to heaven, aren't you? You know how blessed you are that you're going to heaven? All the problems in the world can face you, but you have one thing that you can rejoice in, that you know you're on your way to heaven, and you're a minority. I used to tell my, my, my friends growing up being Greek, I said, we are a minority of minorities. Mm -hmm. Because very few Greeks uh, end up getting saved. Why? Because during the revival that broke up, during the Reformation that broke up throughout Europe, you know what the... The Greek uh, society did. They gathered all the Protestants and they killed them all. They left not one alive. The only one of the few countries in Europe that did that. They were able to exterminate all the Protestants. And what, got, what did it get them? Complete darkness. Complete darkness and slavery. Well, let's not get into that history lesson because I'm, I'm going to chase the rabbit and I won't be able to come out. Uh, come out of the hole that the rabbit pulls me down into. Verse 13, even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. When you see someone who is laughing, it doesn't mean they're happy. Have you ever seen people have this fake laugh? Yeah. They see you, oh, how they laugh, and you know they're being so fake. Yeah, someone made a comment, uh, that's why a lot of comedians commit suicide. They make other people laugh, but deep down inside, uh, their mirth is heaviness. This is this verse right here. They have heavy hearts. The laughter is just a, uh, a, a facade for the pain that they have inside their hearts. And many times, uh, if you read the testimony of some comedians, they become comedians because of, they were ridiculed when they were kids. They were made fun of, so they tried to uh, def deflect the attention from off of them by being funny. And you see a lot of kids that end up being the clowns in the house because they're trying to deflect, they're trying to cover something up. Yeah. The person who often laughs is not always happy. Sometimes people laugh to mask the sorrow that's inside their heart. You can tell this type of laughter. Uh, so, sometimes you say a, a, a bad joke and people laugh to make you feel good about yourself, <laughs> but it's a bad joke. Anyways, just like me now, I'm trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny. Sometimes the best time to be funny is when you are trying to be funny. Yeah. Right? Sometimes we laugh at our kids when they don't try to be funny, but they're being funny without even knowing they're being funny. The Ecclesiastes talks about this kind of laughter. It's the crackling of thorns. Isn't that, what a word picture. The crackling of thorns under a pot. So is the laughter 
of the fool. He says, this also is vanity. And when I was reading this verse, you know what I was reminded of? The villains in the movies that laugh at their uh, devious plan when they're about to commit mischief and they think their plan is the greatest plan in the world. And then what happens? The hero comes in and he and they perish at the hands of the hero and they uh, their sorrow afterwards because their plan foiled. Yeah. The plan was foiled. It was quick, it was short-lived. Uh, I just found that funny. Uh, you may not have found that funny, but I find it funny. And here's another good verse in verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. What do you notice about backsliding here? There's a very important clue we are given. The backsliding begins where? It begins in the heart. The backsliding begins when you start following your heart versus following the ways of God. You know the greatest thing in this world that will deceive you according to the Bible? Is your own heart. Is your own heart. Never trust your heart. What does this world say? Always follow your heart. Isn't that what they say? Follow your heart. Your heart will deceive you. Oh, she's so beautiful. Uh, I'm not going to say it. I had a thought, but I'm going to refrain because it's not good. Um, backsliding is more common than Christians want to admit. Yeah. Remember the hymn, the hymn writer? Uh, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Yeah. The closer you get to God, the, the more sensitive you should be towards backsliding. Uh, it, it's just a fact. A Christian can, can only move in two directions. I know there's not a lot of verse to back this up. Uh, we get this from the fact that Christ says you are lukewarm but God wants you cold or hot, a person can only move toward God or away from God. Mm -hmm. You can't stand still. Uh, what, do we, what do we know about uh, still water? We tell our kids they were trying to uh, raise tadpoles in uh, standing water. We said they're going to die. Things die in standing water. Uh, you need to, the water needs to be moving. There needs to be oxygen being uh, into the water. Regarding the backslide, a Spurgeon said this, the first part of his name is backslider. He's not a backrunner, nor a back leaper, but a backslider. That is to say, he slides back with an easy, effortless motion, softly, quietly, perhaps unsuspected by himself or by anybody else. Isn't that amazing? What, a, what an illustration. And he also said, the story of Judas has been written over and over again in the lives of other traitors. We have heard of a Judas as a deacon, we have heard of a, a Judas as an elder, a Judas preach. We have heard the works of Judas the bishop and seen Judas the missionary. A Judas sometimes continues in his profession for many years, but sooner or later, the true character of the man is discovered. And that's why you hear of all these preachers, they fall from grace, uh, and you say, how can he commit such a thing? Because it was deep down inside her heart, his heart. Uh, and you've got to get rid of those sins of the heart, because eventually they will rear up their ugly heads. The Bible says the backslider will receive a payment for his deeds. Likewise, the good man. And the Bible contrasts the good man with the backslider. Uh, backsliding Christians will receive destruction. Philipp Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. And then in uh, Matthew 16, 27, affirms us. Uh, when you see the lost people and you think they're getting away, you think these looters, they're getting away with what they're doing, the, uh, the uh, people that are vandalizing, they're committing all these horrible acts. Uh, one day, when the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, He will reward every man according to His works. Uh, there's, there's a day of reckoning. We, we, when I see our country and I see our, our politicians getting away with literally murder, uh, it was an, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to get in trouble with all these thoughts that just keep running in my head if I just <laughs> let, let loose. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's scary, but I'm going to keep going on. But uh, all these politicians that get away with murder, you can read between the lines, uh, some of you. <clears throat> We're not going to mention any names. Yes, I like my pantsuit. Uh, that's what somebody said. Uh, not my pantsuit, right? You weren't referring to my pantsuit, were you? No, not yours. You were referring to somebody else's pantsuit. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, we're not talking about anybody in specific. But what they are reckoning is coming. You know that. Uh, they will be rewarded for their deeds. If you think they're getting away from this now, God is keeping tab. God is the greatest accountant there ever is. With that, let's move on to the next part of chapter 14 before we, before we get uh, in trouble for calling out people wearing pantsuits. Uh, what even is that? The 
that's okay. After the lesson, you can ask us. You can ask Miss Nicole, and she'll be glad to tell you. Uh, chapter 14, verse 15. I've titled this part of the lesson, The Simple. The Simple. Uh, you cannot go on life being simple. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and the man of wicked devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is hated, even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Uh, we're going to deal a little bit with the, not too much with the simple, because we've dealt with the simple in uh, lesson one. The simple believeth every word. The simple is one who is uneducated, according to the Bible, and who lacks experience because of youth. Uh, many children are simple because of lack of experience, uh, and that's why God gave them parents. If you're a young child here this morning, or a young uh, a teen, uh, the reason why God gave you parents is because you are still simple. Because you have uh, not been through life. Sometimes you tell your child, you say, if you go down that path, this is what's going to happen to you. And it's frustrating when they don't listen to you, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know, if your child goes down that path, you know exactly what's going to happen. And they look at you, how do you know? Perhaps because you made the same mistake as a parent, or maybe one of your friends did. You know that. And, 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 and prudent, if you're a prudent child, you will listen to mom and dad. You will listen to mom and dad. Because you know what? Most parents, I mean, there are some exceptions, but these are the exceptions. Most parents want the best for their children. Take a survey of the parents and you find, I would say, over 90% of parents will tell you, I want the best for my kids. The wisdom in this book will make the young person and the inexperienced person know what to do with life and how to do it. Uh, in this Bible, you'll find out how to, how to marry. You'll find out how to rule your house. You'll find out how to serve God. You'll find out how to, how to handle your finances. Uh, you find out how to handle society, how to handle those who are in authority over you, how to handle your children. All the answers are in this book. The reason why uh, you're in so much trouble in your life is because you don't look into this book. Right. Uh, we have to be careful not to be simple. We have to be like the Bereans. We have to search everything we are taught and hear in the Word of God. Uh, you're taught something, and well, that's one thing I, I try to do is when I teach something, I try to back it up with verses. I don't just teach from off the top of my head. And I try to back it up with verses. I try. Uh, in Acts 17, we are told, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. So when they heard the preaching of Paul, they received it. But then they questioned it through the word of God. And once they found that it lined up with the Word of God, then they believed it. God never will, God will never ridicule you or chastise you for questioning Him. Because He Himself says, Come, let us reason together. He will never do God hates it when you question Him, and then He gives you the answer, and then you don't like the answer. That's what God hates. And we dealt with the prudent man in verse 8 of this lesson. And again in Lesson 1, Lesson 12, Lesson 20, and Lesson 22. Uh, the Proverbs has a lot to say about the prudent man. Yeah. You have to be careful. One of the things I think a lot of us need is more prudent, to be more prudent with our words. We've got to filter what comes out of our mouth. Sometimes what, can, what is said can never be unsaid. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got to be careful what comes out of your mouth. A wise man, verse 16 and 17. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. You will quickly uh, get the idea that the fool is an angry person. Uh, the fool is contrasted with the wise man in the Bible ex exhaustively. The, the contrast between these two men is very exhaustive. Uh, you'd think that God would you think that we have gotten the message by now, but no. One of the things you'll see through the book of Proverbs is a lot of repetition between the fool and the wise. Uh, but one thing you will note about the uh, foolish person 
He is an angry person. He is full of rage. Uh, you know you're a fool when someone tries to tell you what is right and you rebel immediately. You're being a fool. I don't know how else to sugarcoat this, but that's a fact. Especially when you have a child and you try to correct the child, you try to set the path of the child, the child on the right path, and they rebel immediately at your admonition, you have a fool. You've got to pray to God if you have a foolish son or daughter. Uh, you've got to pray, pray hard for your children, that, that God changes them from being fools into being wise people. Someone said, anger is temporary madness. How true that is. Uh, the Bible says anger is okay if you, have, if you are justified, but you just get angry over nothing. Sometimes I watch the news and I get angry, and my wife says, why do you watch the news? I can't help it. I, uh, I want to know what's going on. But if it's going to make you angry, why do you keep watching it? She's so right. Mm -hmm. She is so right. Uh, the fool is convinced that his way is right. Uh, and there's no way he could be wrong. How, how, how many times have you heard this expression? Why should I listen to you? Mm -hmm. You heard that? Why is your way the right way? You're being a fool. Uh, the simple inherit folly but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Uh, you know what to inherit folly is? When you inherit folly, you inherit basically hell. You inherit destruction. But if you are prudent, you will not inherit folly. That's the contrast here in this verse. You will be crowned with knowledge. Uh, how do you get to heaven? Through knowledge. Knowledge of the truth. Sure. One of the things uh, I can say that I had a heart for, and I still do, is truth at all costs. Lord, show me the truth, even if it goes against what I believe, even if it goes against my preconceived ideas and notions, Lord, give me the truth. I want nothing but the truth. And God will give you the truth. Next verse says, uh, verse 19, The evil bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Today it feels like it's the opposite, right? Uh, that the we, leave, we see all these protesters and they're, uh, they're making demands. Yes, some of the demands are justified, but some of them, most of them are not. And it's often that the, the good is bowing before the evil, giving in to the evil. Um, and there was a, uh, I was reading a story, again, I'm not making a comment on any political party, but I'm making a comment on uh, leadership. So don't get me wrong by saying this. I was reading an article about the governor in South Dakota. Uh, this governor... She never told people what to do. She never told people that they ought to wear a mask. She never told people that they ought to social distance. All she said was, these are the recommendations from my office. And uh, you're smart people. Do what is right. And, uh, and that state has one of the lowest occurrences of, of, of this COVID. And when there was a, in one of the cities of that state, when they started the rioting, immediately she called the National Guard and it was stopped on its tracks, immediately. That's law and order. Uh, our Constitution says we ought to, as someone, uh, I'm gonna say something. Uh, one politician, I'm not gonna give you his name, in New York, was saying uh, that, well, where does it say we, ha we, have to, we have to peacefully protest? And there was a guy, he put a video and he was munching on something, and he has over his shoulder, he goes, um, the Constitution? We have the right to protest, but peacefully protest. Sure. I just found that funny. I, couldn't, I watched it over and over again because I couldn't, couldn't stop laughing. How true that is. Uh, in our society, the evil is bowing before the good. But you know one day, the, all evil in our society, the good is bowing before the evil, right? Yeah. yeah. Because I was looking at Romans 14 and Philippians 2. Uh, my mind went ahead of me, but I'm glad you caught that. Romans 14, 11 says, For it is written... As I lift up the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Uh, right now, it may look like evil is getting away, but the day will come that, that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, Philippians 2.12, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Every evil thing, every evil person, every wicked person will bow before Christ. And during the millennial uh, kingdom, the nations, the wicked, they will bow before us in the temple of God. That's what this means. Uh, they're not going to worship us. They're just going to bow, and we're going to rule with Christ, and we're going to reign with Christ. This is a bowing as a reverence. Sometimes when you see the word bow in the Bible, uh, it could be a reference to worship, and it could be a reference to reverence. Like when 
people approached the king, what did they do? In the Old Testament. They bowed. they bowed before the king. Does that mean they worshiped the king? No. They just paid respect to the king. They paid homage to the king. Uh, Revelation 2.26 give us, gives us this promise. And he that overcometh and keep my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. One day the wicked will bow before the good, the righteous. We have plenty of examples in the Bible about the wicked bowing before the righteous. Uh, look at the uh, well, first example is Joseph's brothers. What did they do before him? They bowed before him. Remember what uh, Jacob said to him? Shall I and thy mother and thy brothers worship, worship you or bow before you? And they did. Shimei was an evil man, wicked man. He bowed before David. Feared for his life. First he cursed David and then when David came back from the insurrection, he defeated Absalom. He, he quickly ran to David and he bowed before him asking, uh, pleading for his life. We've got a few more verses left. Uh, verse 19. Uh, verse 20, we just did 19, uh, 14, verse 20. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich have many friends. Isn't that true? Uh, it doesn't seem like the rich people have a lot of friends. Yeah. But what do we do with the poor? We kind of try to avoid the poor. Uh, we don't like being around the poor people. But when the money dries up, what happens to all the friends? Uh, they drive too. All the friends disappear. You hear the joke, the story is, uh, you hear, and I'm not, I'm not condoning uh, getting a lottery ticket, but a lot of people that win the lottery, what happens? They, people call them from out of the blue. Oh, my long lost friend, how have you been? They heard they won the lottery, so now they give them a call. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not condoning uh, getting a lottery or buying uh, tickets, but I'm just saying I find it ironic that all of a sudden they come, they come across all this money and they have friends coming out of the woodwork. Oh, I'm your long lost cousin, really? But James talks about we have to be careful uh, that we don't that we are not partial that we don't show partiality between the, the rich and the poor. In James chapter two verse uh, two and three, he says, "For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit here under my footstool." But James is saying, "Aren't you being partial when you do that?" Uh, we are all equal under God. God created us equally. Uh, and people forget that. There's no room for uh, bigotry in the kingdom of God, in God's family. Now, uh, there's differences among people. There's differences among cultures. But we are all the children of God. I'm not talking about the uh, born-again Christians here. I'm talking about humanity. Because God created us all. Everyone has a soul and a spirit created by God. Every single human being, uh, their soul has been created by God. When you uh, hate your neighbor, you basically are breaking. Uh, I did not read the verse, right? Okay, verse 21. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Uh, because the poor, the, the word poor is in this verse. I got a little ahead of myself. So... We are not, we are commanded to what? Love our neighbor. And what happens if you hate your neighbor? You're basically breaking the second commandment, quote unquote. Uh, Christ says there are two commandments. One is to love God with all your heart, and the second is to love neighbor as yourself. God commanded us to love our neighbors. In Leviticus 19.18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. In Matthew 24, Matthew 22, verse 38 and 40, the same thing. Christ repeats this commandment. And he says, this is the first and great commandment regarding loving God. And the second is like unto it. What is the second commandment? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I think the problem today's society is we don't really love our neighbors. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't destroy his property. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't take his wife. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't burn his, his, his business. It's happening today. The reason why these people are looting and pillaging is because they do not love their neighbor. I don't care why you're protesting. I don't care the reason behind your protest. Uh, the destruction that you are committing is because you do not love your neighbor. Right. The Bible says also it is better to give than to receive uh, because we have to uh, love the poor. And I think a lot of churches, uh, and I, I hope one day we can start a ministry to the poor. One of the, one of the things that we have to do is help the poor. Yes, we like to give to missions, 
but we have to somehow, uh, again, as our church grows and the Lord gives us uh, opportunity, we have to start a ministry for the poor. We will always have the poor. In Matthew 26, 11, it confirms that. You're never going to erase poverty. All these people, the war in poverty, it's a losing battle. You're never going to eradicate poverty. Why? Because Christ says, you have the poor always with you. You cannot change the word of God. Right. Um, I'm going to just end off with just a few funny things I came across as I was uh, studying for uh, poor people. We are so poor that we eat cereal with a fork so we could save on milk. Ha ha, right? I am so poor that if somebody tried to rob me, they'd be practicing. We are so poor that the birds throw bread at us. I am so poor that I can't even pay attention. <laughs> Anyways, I just thought to let uh, end the lesson on a, on a high note here. Uh, any questions or comments on this lesson? Okay, great. I'm uh, glad. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. And next week we will uh, continue on. And uh, next time we'll meet you next Wednesday, same same time, same place.